Welcome. So today we're going to go over a simple example of feedforward amplifier compensation. And we're asked to consider the simple two-stage feedforward op-amp shown on the right here. And these capacitances CO1 and CO2 are somehow fixed at 150 femtofarads. The intrinsic gain of these GMRO amplifiers, these transconductance amplifier, is limited presumably by the technology in which they're implemented to 10. And we're asked to select the transconductances uh, required to ensure that the open loop gain is at least 50 up to 500 megahertz and a phase margin of 45 degrees is provided. So let's think about this problem a little bit. First of all, we're going to focus on the red path through the amplifier here, which is a second order path. That's going to provide most of our gain in band. So that's obvious. The, the response through that path uh, being second order is going to be constant up to some frequency and then roll off thereafter with a slope of uh, 40 dB per decade. The blue path, on the other hand, is a first order path. That's our feed forward path through GM3. And that is going to have a lower gain since there's only one gain stage in there. But it is going to roll off at only 20 dB per decade. And so that's going to introduce this lead compensating zero into the response. So focusing on the, the red path first, in order to meet our gain spec, we see that the DC gain through those two stages is limited by this requirement here to be 10 times 10 or 100. So in order to ensure that we've got a magnitude response over 50 up to 500 megahertz, we need to ensure that the two poles introduced at these two nodes um, causes the magnitude response to dip only by 6 dB with respect to that DC gain of 100. Uh, so that'll occur when the two poles are again arising due to these two no nodes, both arise right at 50 megahertz, uh, 500 megahertz, sorry. So that will ensure that each of the poles introduces minus 3 dB compared to the DC gain for a total of minus 6 dB, that'll give us our DC gain, that'll give us our, our gain of 50 at 500 megahertz. So how do we ensure that? Well, we've got the capacitances at those nodes. Uh, they're 150 femtofarads each. So we've simply got to select the output resistances R01 and 2 so that the time constant at these two nodes each corresponds to a pole at 500 megahertz. So there's the pole frequency, the capacitance, and we can calculate the required resistance. The transconductance, GM1 and GM2, is then determined by the fact that the gain, the DC gain of each of these transconductance amplifiers is only 10. So we can use this expression now. to calculate those transconductances. GM1 and GM2 are the DC gain 10 over the resistances. That gives us 4.7 milliamps per volt. Next, we've got to introduce the feedforward compensation transconductor GM3. We've got to choose the right value for GM3 to ensure 45 degrees of phase margin. So if we assume that the two low frequency poles here, these two poles are going to um, give rise to about 180 degrees phase shift, then we need the lead compensating zero introduced by GM3 to give us a plus 45 degrees phase lead. And that'll give us the required 45 degrees phase margin. So if we use this expression here for the location of the zero, as a function of the gains of each of the stages, we see that we can relate the zero frequency to the gains and to the pole frequency. The first pole frequencies through the red path are both located at 500 megahertz. We know that DC gain AV1 times AV2 is equal to 100. So we can now calculate what we need AV3 to be. And from that, infer what GM3 needs to be.
So specifically, we see that AV3, that's the gain GM3 times RO2, has to also equal 10. That means GM3 is just going to be the same as GM2. So what we end up with is a um, situation really where the zero kicks in, you know, uh, right, right at the gain crossover frequency, something like this. Okay. And that's going to give us the extra 45 degrees phase shift. So um, that's all good for the hand calculations. Let's see how it works out in simulations. We've got that entered here to our simulator. You can see the transconductances are all 4.7 milliamps per volt for GM1, GM2, and GM3. The capacitance is 150 femtofarads at each node, and the output resistance is uh, 2.1K as we calculate it. We're just gonna run an AC simulation here to see what kind of phase margin we get. So first of all, you can see the magnitude response here, the solid line. If we focus on the point at 500 megahertz, we see we've got a gain of about 34 and a half dB. If you just look at the cursor value there in the bottom left corner, I know it's quite small, but 34 dB corresponds to 550 uh, volts per volt, which uh, meets our spec. It's a little bit subtle, but you, you know, if you take close note, you'll see that the magnitude response is rolling off here at 40 dB per decade, and then it does bend slightly upward due to the leap compensating resistor. The effect of that is perhaps more obvious looking at the phase response shown here at the dotted line, where you see clearly if the phase response is going down towards minus 180 degrees, but then curves back up and approaches minus 90 degrees asymptotically. Again, that's because at high frequencies, the response is solely determined by the path through GM3 here. So let's check our phase margin. The phase margin. Um, can be observed by looking at the unity gain frequency here. It's about uh, six and a half gigahertz. If we go down, look at the phase response there. Indeed, it's uh, it's at around 100 and uh, minus 135 degrees. So a little bit more than 45 degrees of phase margin, just like we calculated. Um, there's some slight deviation from that because the zero, in addition to changing the phase response also uh, introduces a little bend in the magnitude response. So it extends the unity gain frequency a little higher than our calculations assumed. But um, you know the uh, approximations are all pretty good here. So uh, we've also, for fun here, we can look at what happens if we use a three-stage feedforward amplifier to try and achieve the similar specs. So here I've chosen some values that still respect the limit that all the GMs times the R outs that they drive are all equal to 10 or less. So the assumption here is that it's a similar technology, or sorry, in this case, um, I correct myself, all the GM times R outs are limited to only seven. So the idea here is that we're in uh, a different technology now with a lower intrinsic gain. So we have to use three gain stages to meet the same spec. Um, so we're still shooting for 50, a gain of 50 up to 500 megahertz. Um, but now we need three stages in order to achieve that. The node capacitances are all 150 femtofarads as before. And uh, you'll see if we run a simulation here, run our AC simulation, we'll see what happens. So now, again, if you take close note, you would notice that the magnitude response is rolling off here at 60 dB per decade because it's determined by the th third order path through GM1, GM2, and GM3 in the schematic. You'll also note the phase response goes you know, almost all the way to 180, minus 180 degrees. It's actually asymptotically going towards minus 270 degrees, but now there's two zeros introduced so that again, it bends upwards towards minus 90 degrees asymptotically, and the magnitude response also bend upwards. Uh, now, if we look at the magnitude response at 500 megahertz, that's around here, you'll notice that we've still got a magnitude response of about 34 dB. So it's the same. It's uh, about 50 volts per volt at 500 megahertz. However, the DC gain is a little lower, but that's okay. It's still meeting our spec requirement in band. Um, and Let's check our phase margin here at zero dB crossover, the unigain crossover frequency here. 
Uh, it's now lower than before, again, because of this deeper roll off, but we've still got our phase shift of about minus 135, so about 45 degrees phase margin. So this is interesting. And another thing I'd note that if you sum together all the transconductances here, all the GMs, you've actually got a lower total transconductance, despite the fact that there's now five transconductances than what was required to meet the same specs with a two-stage amplifier. Even though we're in you know, a, a technology with a lower intrinsic gain, we're able to go to three-stage feed forward amp. And assuming that all the bias currents are related to the transconductances, proportional to the required transconductances, then actually you may end up with lower um, power consumption for this three-stage feed-forward amp, meeting similar specs, um, in spite of the fact that you've got lower intrinsic gain and you need more stages. So that's it. I hope that uh, helps you understand this feed-forward amplifier compensation.